Shannon Waller here, and welcome to a special episode of the Team Success Podcast. And today I have a repeat visitor, a repeat person I'm going to talk with, and that is Emily Morgan. And why I really appreciate, Emily, that you come on the call today is because you are an expert in how to work with people who are not physically at your location in what's called a remote workforce. There are so many ins and outs and so many different ways of looking at it and understanding how to make that relationship a successful one is not something that many people know how to do yet. And so, Emily, I really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. Before we jump into the conversation with Emily, I also need to say that Emily is a current coach client, which I am super excited about. Years and years ago, you actually were in the original strategic assistant program, then left and started your own organization, which is incredibly successful, and now is in the coach program, which I think is, at least from our side, just an amazing representation of progress. And I know, Emily, you're really happy to be in the program, too. Absolutely. I think that we have similar messaging, so (laughs) it's been a very easy process for me. Oh, that's awesome. So just to get everyone up to speed to make sure we're all in the same contextual mindset here, what exactly is a remote workforce? And I know that there's a bigger conversation, too, in that the world is changing, people are becoming more mobile. So let's just talk about some of the specific terms so that we can all be on the same page. Sure. Well, remote workforce is really just about people that are not physically working next to you in your office. And while that might present challenges to people initially, there's a lot of adaptations that can be made in the way that you're operating your company to accommodate remote workforce. And there's a lot of reasons to consider using this as a way to improve your flex work benefits at your company. I like what you said. It will change a little bit of how you work, but I suspect you'll become a lot more systematic and probably a clearer communicator as a result of working with someone who's not on site. Yeah, I think those are the two key takeaways from working with remote support successfully is to really have systems and processes in place that people can easily access and follow and have a system in place to be able to communicate not only just on the day-to-day level, but communicate effectively about goals that everyone's collectively trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. So you'll become better as a result of working with someone who's not on site. I like that. (laughs) Well, it's less distracting. (laughs) That's a great point. I know sometimes even around here when people go to work from home, usually because of a very specific project, they're like, oh, I get so much done. And there is a really clear deliverable or result at the end of it, which I know we'll get to more. So Before we get into the specifics, let's talk about how this has emerged. I know without technology that this wouldn't even be possible, really. But the world's changing. I mean, you work with highly successful entrepreneurs in terms of your client base who are moving at a million miles an hour on a slow day. And you also know, because you tap into this workforce, of a lot of people who are in different cities or different locations from maybe the company that they work for. So talk about how the world is changing and how more flexibility is really important to the successful results, not only for companies, but also for the people working for them. Yeah, I think that effective leadership is really about managing the outcome, not just making sure that people are showing up to fulfill a certain schedule every day. Mm -hmm. So technology has really created a place where we don't need to come to work in order to actually get our work done. And so that just requires a mentality of the way that leaders think about creating a place where people actually want to work and reasons why they want to work there. So your culture, your flex work benefits. Having a successful team is really what's going to differentiate you from competitors that might be trying to offer the same product or service, but you're able to offer people that are working there because of certain reasons. Mm -hmm. I love what you said about culture because that is kind of everything to me. I mean, I want to have a results-oriented culture, but I also want one where people love coming to work and it's fun and they're looking forward to interacting with others. I guess one of a lot of people's assumptions is that if you don't see people all the time, it's harder to create that culture. Is that true? Uh, Not in my experience. (laughs) Great. I think that people are trying to connect to the value and mission of a company, and that's what is differentiating what you're doing versus someone that offers the same product or service. And that's what's going to allow you to attract the kind of talent that you know, is going to carry your company forward into the future. So if you consider people to be your company's most valuable resource, attracting them and retaining them and motivating them is really the most important job that you as a leader need to bring to the table. 
Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point, actually, that if we have a choice of local people who are just looking for a J-O-B, or if you can find someone who's in a different location connected remotely, but they're really passionate about what you do, and they bring not only their intellect to work, but also their heart, you have a much more engaged workforce just by definition. Exactly. Leaders need to create a place where people want to show up and work or Mm -hmm. be present for their work. And that they'll be much more engaged if they do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Engaging them is what's going to create value for the company. Okay, perfect. Having engaged team members. Yes, we are all about engagement at the moment. That's awesome. So currently there's about 34 million people that are telecommuting, at least occasionally in the U.S., and by 2016, they're anticipating it's going to be 63 million. So it's certainly not something that we can ignore. (laughs) Wow. Um, And then... In terms of freelancers, by 2020, it's expected that more than 40% of all workers, which is over 60 million people, will actually be freelancers. And this is all coming out of this really great ebook that I found. It's called The Future of Work. And it's a free ebook that you can download on fowcommunity.com, so futureofworkcommunity.com. Wow, those are kind of amazing stats. Yeah, I mean, it's really speaking to a shift in the way that we as leaders are staffing our company. Mm-hmm. So if we're not on board yet, we need to at least have the, the framework and also probably the processes, the systems, and the technology to make that work. Yeah, and I think just the understanding that we're trying to create value for our team rather than just provide someone with a job. People aren't looking for a job anymore. Mm-hmm. They're looking to connect with what they're doing and have it fit into their life in meaningful ways. So really sitting with that concept. Well, it's interesting. It it sounds like to me it's reprioritizing that purpose and meaning and obviously flexibility are really almost the biggest attractors versus a nice office building with a ping pong table or something like that. Exactly. Like, for example, my team is staffed with mainly moms that are looking for a scenario where they can professionally work from home using their skill set. So what they're going to value is a lot different than what other people are hiring for. So you need to be thinking about what your team specifically values and they're motivated by. Mm -hmm. That's a really great point. So let's jump into some of the ins and outs, the do's and don'ts of having this be successful. And it's kind of interesting if I think about coach, for the people that are in the Toronto area, people come into the office, but we have a number of people who work in different countries, you know, definitely different cities. And it works actually really, really well. And sometimes I forget that they're remote because I see them a lot. I mean, physically, I'll see them on Skype or on. We have a little cool little beam robot, which is really neat. So people beam into meetings, literally, and that kind of thing. So they feel just as much a part of the team as though they were here, which is kind of amazing. That didn't used to be at all possible. So our team uses a lot of different tools to keep in touch throughout the day. We use instant message. There are really great team instant message tools like Slack or HipChat that you can use to deploy across your team. When we do our team calls, we use group video, like live stream video of everyone's face, and you can do screen share. There's two tools. One is called Fuse and one is called Zoom that you can check out. Mm -hmm. And then for our internal kind of day-to-day calls, we'll use Skype quickly get each other on the phone. Mm, That's awesome. Well, I appreciate those resources too, because I've heard about Slack, but I haven't heard really a lot about the other ones. So definitely have to check those out. And group video for me is always a bit of a challenge. I'm always looking for really good resources for that. So this is something that you know intimately because this is how you run your own company. All of your 25 employees are remote. Is that right? Yeah, we run everywhere from East Coast, I'm here in New Jersey, to we have team members in Hawaii. So we span every time zone. (laughs) Let's talk about that for a sec, because that can make it challenging, because that's our experience. We have team members over eight time zones. That can make it interesting. Yeah, well, that's why you set really clear timelines around when the team is expected to be available for calls. When you start working together, you establish criteria around when they're available to work during the day, when you expect to be hearing from them. So you just kind of set all that up from the beginning so all the expectations are clear. Mm, I like that. So how do you manage a remote team? Because I think aligning on expectations is absolutely essential. But how do you manage people that you don't physically see on a regular basis? (laughs) Well, it's always challenging. Mm -hmm. Before we bring team members to work directly with clients, they're working behind the scenes with our team daily. So they're doing support 
support tasks and activities to support our client-facing team members. So we're getting a good experience with them before they're ever touching a client, and they're kind of learning the ropes, and we're kind of making sure that they can operate remotely in a way that we all feel comfortable with. So during that time, they're getting trained as well and going through different modules. From there, once they're working directly with clients, we require that they're checking in with us at least once a week. They have to submit what we call a wrap-up, and that wrap-up really just talks about the work that was done on the account, and we ask that they create a connection between the work that was done and the work that we said we were going to do. We use something called an action plan, which is a goals-focused delegation plan. So they have to tie what they did to that plan every week so that we're kind of creating focus around the activities we said were important. We also use a time tracking tool, so we're able to check at any time down to the minute what the person is doing because they have to line item the different tasks. So there's lots of ways that you can do it from an efficiency standpoint and not a micromanagement standpoint. You know, there's also the thing about how do you develop team members and how do they get better at what they're doing? Is there coaching time built in or just the time to get to know people as well? I try to ensure that the team knows each other. So we have a listserv that we use to kind of think through if someone's having an issue with a client, they can access this listserv to send questions and the team can collectively help sort that out. We also do a backup training program so they get to work together that way because they'll back each other up if someone needs time off or if they need help on a project. So we try to foster a community in that sense. Mm -hmm. Because that's one of the things I think that I know some work environments where there is no community even though people are physically there. (laughs) But trying to create a community remotely definitely has a few other hoops I think you definitely have to jump through. We certainly haven't perfected it but we have ambitions to really (laughs) really be the best in the industry doing this sort of like remote team building. And I think that laying the foundations of expectations from the beginning is really the most critical piece to it being a success. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for a lot of situations and where a lot of team member, employer relationships go awry or even client relationships go awry is because there is not that alignment of expectations. So that's essential. Right. Yeah, I love it. So now, Again, this is what you do, and I didn't even mention your company before. It's Delegate Solutions, which if you're interested, please check out because Emily's got a ton of resources, an amazing blog, this amazing action plan you can download, which I highly recommend. It's very thorough and very clear. As I was looking through it, I'm like, oh, okay, then I'm going to get much more concrete and results focused about what I actually want to have happen. So, again, great resource. (laughs) But for companies who are looking for increased flexibility in terms of their workforce and who kind of want some other options, how does this work? How do they decide which tasks they can outsource or how they can work with someone remotely? Where do people start? You want to think about what you can do to engage remote support teams that can increase efficiency and productivity. So the way to do that is to have really clear projects with clear deliverables and hopefully clear processes. Those are some of the easy places to really engage with strategic support or remote workforces. It's really great for companies that have key projects that they need to pull in support for but don't want to have to go through the headache of trying to find and hire someone and train them and all of that. You can just plug and play with a remote worker that way. They can provide elasticity. So if your team is overwhelmed or underwhelmed, it can be used to supplement your existing support staff through a certain period of time. So if business is really slow in the winter, you can potentially cut an FTE and use a strategic support resource in that place. Or if your FTE is totally overwhelmed and she can't get to key projects because she's just too busy on scheduling and travel, You can just pull in a remote worker to sort of delegate those things off of your existing support person's plate. So it's really meant to be great for projects and processes that can be delegated easily and to provide elasticity for existing team. Mm -hmm. That's such a great model. All of a sudden I have this accordion sense of (laughs) of how how your workforce can work. So instead of full-time employees, you can have remote and you can really balance between the two quite elegantly. I talk with entrepreneurs all the time about delegating, and I know you do too, and that's not something a lot of people do easily. So what are some of the things that people can delegate? 
Sure. One other point about where you can really use this remote workforce is if you have existing staff that are looking to job share with someone, rather than hire another FTE, you could potentially engage a remote worker to do that yeah. or to cover maternity or family leave rather than bring in a temp where you're dealing with another personality in the office. Remote workers are really just about efficiency and getting certain things done. So mm-hmm. that's another way to think about it. So what are some of those tasks? What are some of the things that people do figure out how to delegate? Sure. So some of the easy things, invoicing and expenses, sending invoices, reconciling QuickBooks, creating expense reports, managing recurring billing with clients, accounts payable, accounts receivable, researching projects. So data mining, competitor research, looking up different vendors as options and compiling data so that you can make a good decision. You could look at different areas in marketing, so setting up e-blast campaigns, scheduling and monitoring social media posts, logging sales contact information after you meet with clients, you know, making sure that there's follow-up that's happening and trying to automate some of that. And then there's just your general admin, so scheduling, managing your inbox, formatting documents, getting ready for board meetings, pre-screening new hires for you. So really, we try to focus on what is going to be contributing to your overall goals and start with those items. Then we look at things that you're doing that you don't need to be doing that someone else could do or things that you don't enjoy doing or things that we can automate or systematize so no one has to do them. Okay, it's an incredible picture of everything that I or we could get rid of. <laughs> it's very appealing. <laughs> I like that. A lot of the stuff that needs to get done, but it feels hard or arduous. Now, I'm hoping your team actually really likes to do this sort of work. And I know this from a unique ability standpoint, so I'm not even sure why I'm asking the question. But I love that there are people out there who'd love to do that kind of stuff that I don't. Yeah, I mean, we look for people on our team that really love to help other people. Our team also has really high Colby scores on the first two numbers, so they're really good at data and research and setting up systems and processes, too. Yeah, so lots of fact-finding and lots of follow-through. Yeah. Which most entrepreneurs need a lot of help with, and team leaders, too. So I think it's not even just something for business owners. Even for team leaders who've got a busy team or need some of that flexibility that you're talking about, this would be a phenomenal solution. Now, one of the things I know you talk about in your blog, one of your blogs, is the different levels of support. You're hiring an incredibly talented, capable, experienced person. That's the kind of remote workforce that you've created. There are some also, I know, other options too. I remember years ago, I think I mentioned this in our last interview, when I read Tim Ferriss's four-hour work week, and I was like, oh, this is great, and I attempted to hire your man in India. (laughs) (laughs) And I couldn't figure out anything for them to do. (laughs) It was like 20 bucks or 25 bucks. I was like, by the time I would delegate it, I could have had it done, which did make me do a few things. It was just so simple. It was too simple, as a matter of fact, because I needed another brain to figure out what I should be doing. But can you talk about it in the industry? Because there's different levels of expertise or capability that people can try out, or people should just know what the range is. Sure. So I'll talk a little bit about what the things are to consider when you're trying to make this decision, and then briefly what the options are. So you want to think about your level of commitment and how involved you want to be in the process in the delegation process like you were mentioning, and how much work do you need or want to offload. Then you want to think about the different levels of tasks and access required to manage those tasks. So how involved are they, and is it a scenario where someone could log in remotely and handle that for you? Is this person going to be interfacing with your team or your clients? There's a culture fit that needs to happen there and a culture training that needs to happen there for that to be smooth and seamless. So it depends on whether or not they are going to be touching anyone on your team. You want to think about whether or not you have documented processes because one of the easiest things to hand off are some of those rote processes that all businesses have that are just recurring and need to get handled but don't necessarily need any sort of like internal resource managing them. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then think about the volume and frequency. So does the volume of tasks fluctuate during the month, during the year? Does it need to be handled by the same person each time or could it be handled by multiple people? And really important is how quickly do you need these things turned around? So what level of response do you need from a support remote worker? Mm -hmm. Then I would say there's about three different options when it comes to working with remote support. The first is what we call transactional. So you're basically paying per task, which is what you were describing. 
there's a company called Fancy Hands that handles this exact sort of scenario where you need flowers ordered or you need a dinner reservation. You're not saying that you need a full-time assistant, but you need help with certain tasks. You can reach to them. You don't have any relationship with them. It's all done remotely, and there's no, like, strategy behind it. It's just simply about delegating a task. The second is what we call the basic or task-focused. So this is more involved. It's all done remotely. You usually have a dedicated person working with you, but there's no strategy. They're not really helping you identify tasks or systems or working on anything that's very evolved. It's really just about basic daily administrative work. And then the last grouping is what I would consider our service to be, which is strategic delegation, consulting, and support. So we would do the delegation strategy and design. We'd help you figure out what it is that you're trying to delegate and how to do that successfully. It's also all handled remotely. You have a dedicated assistant plus access to a whole team of others. And we really just look to set up a plan to help execute what it is you're trying to achieve and then work with you daily to make that happen. That's powerful because I know certainly with a lot of people I work with, and you work with coach clients as well, is the strategic part is what's so essential because I know I've got this big plate of stuff. Actually, I've got someone working with me now who's genius and loves to do everything. I don't. She's great. <laughs> I know. You've met her, Nicole. It's so profound, but I didn't know what I didn't know. And I appreciate I don't think there are very many delegate solutions out there. Are there? I mean, I've heard of Fancy Hands. What's the name of one of the companies that's at that second tier? So it was virtual, but they actually shut down pretty much overnight, and then Did they – got bought and reopened or something. So I was wary to mention them because I'm not quite sure what their structure is currently, but it's a company like Zirtual or it's your traditional virtual assistant that you would basically find online. Got it. Okay, good. Are there many people that like you that do the, not that I'm asking you to name your competitors because I'm not, <laughs> but are there many people out there who take that strategic approach? I don't think so, no. And I think ours has come out of doing it the other ways over the years and just kind of finding that that isn't really what people need in terms of our ideal client. So just evolving what it is that we are already doing into an actual service offering. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that you saw that need out there and addressed the higher level because a lot of people don't go that route. I read some of the great case studies from our clients. It was really fun to see how all of this just comes together and the specific things that they've delegated and the specific things they've freed themselves up for. And I like the story of one of your examples where there was a leadership team that had to get leveraged. Can you talk about that for a moment? Because there are all of these tasks that they were doing, but they weren't actually doing the leading and the strategizing for the company. And I thought that was kind of a fascinating example of how you provide leverage. Yeah, I mean, we really just always start with the question of explain to us what your goals are and what you're trying to achieve. And then what we do is we look at the overall goals and we say, all right, what is the 20% that you specifically need to be doing? Let's make sure that you're focused when we free up your time that you're focused on those activities. And then there's still that 80% of all the different tasks that need to happen to support that goal. And that's what we try to take off of the plate of leadership teams, leaders in general. So tell us a little bit about that team, because I love teams of any kind. But I found the improvement that you were able to give them to provide for them was quite a big shift in terms of their productivity, I think. Yeah, I think they were already working as a virtual firm. So they had that sort of concept down across the board. But they really needed a strategic solution to help them kind of get clear and get focused on their key activities. So we did things for them like manage their inbox. For the key leader, we'll do all of his inbox so he doesn't have to worry about it. We would do research for them on conferences that were upcoming, deploy employee surveys so that their team could gauge engagement and interest across the team. We actually did some social media training for their team as well, where we did an actual webinar on LinkedIn and helping them sort of deploy a LinkedIn strategy that the whole team can use. So, you know, many, many things that they were able to clear off their plate. And what's clear is that you actually become a part of their team. You're another resource. You're another remote person. Now, it's a company with team members as opposed to just one person. But you, it really is that strategic influence rather than just strictly tactical. Yes, and I think it's important to note remote support can be deployed in, in any direction. That's what I think is the most beautiful thing about what we do and what other remote workers do. Like we're really about productivity and efficiency, and 
we want to contribute in a way that's going to make the most impact for you, the client. Mm -hmm. That's great. Again, I just want to go back to where people need to start is by looking at what they have and all those great criteria you gave about commitment and how involved you want to be and what's your turnaround time and who are they interfacing with and all those things. So, Emily, you've given me a fabulous picture of the difference that this can make, the distinction about strategic support as opposed to a strategic solution as opposed to just the tactical to me is a fairly profound shift, at least in my thinking from what I've read and what I've seen on social media and stuff like that. So I really appreciate that distinction. And it sounds like this is something that as companies are looking at how they grow, and we, we like to talk to our clients about going 10 times, at least in terms of their ambition and also their results and their revenue and their profit and all those great things, and their impact, that this is really a strategy that everyone needs to think about. Some of your workers are going to be remote. Some of our workers are remote because they moved. So they were here, they've moved away, and we didn't want to lose them. So we figured out a way to make it work, even though we may not have gone into it with that way of thinking about things. But really moving forward for a lot of companies, as you talked about in the book, The Future of Work, this needs to be something we all need to know about, we need to be cognizant of, we need to be prepared for, to be organized for. Is that right? Yeah, I really see the shift in the future of work, to use the terminology, as an opportunity for us as entrepreneurs to kind of reimagine and redesign a flexible, happier workforce, because that's really the direction that employment is going on a universal level to be able to provide work that people are passionate about and that they connect to and provide balance and value for employees that you're trying to retain because they really are the ones carrying your company forward. And they're looking for ways to balance their life with their work and try and make them work together seamlessly. So whether you're considering ways to help your team engage some flex work or remote work capabilities, or you're looking to strategically hire remote workers for specific projects. Like this is just something that should be considered as a way to grow in the future. Hmm, I really like that. So I have a question to ask you because I know I'm going to get asked this actually, Mm -hmm. is for people who have a resistance to this, while some don't know how to do it, they're just like, "Mm, I like working with people I can see or touch or hear or be around or who somehow just don't have this mindset yet, what would you say to them? Or what's a way to kind of make it more normal or more something that is just a part of how we think about work? Well, it could be a baby step approach, but I think shifting your work environment to a results-based work environment rather than just a time-based work environment is really the mental shift that needs to happen. And it needs to happen for your team as well as yourself. And obviously the fear comes in because it's giving up some control (laughs) that you're used to having control that comes out of a value of seeing someone sitting at a desk for a certain amount of time doing things. So, you know, even if you just start to incorporate different elements of remote work, remote workforce or remote options for your team, as long as you send them out into that sort of like flexible environment with clear parameters and goals and expectations around communication, I think you're making a step in the right direction. Well, that's brilliant because I think you've actually just hit the nail on the head (laughs) (laughs) that if you have a time-based mindset, then yes, you want to be able to control that fear of not having control over people or not knowing what they're doing is really what drives that shift. So I think that's pretty key. And I know for our company, because we are so clear on that we want access to people's thinking and collaboration and creativity that we want to be able to be with people as much as possible. But I think you'd say that technology you know, good technology is what can make that happen. It's not just that you've delegated the work and there's just some automaton, is that the word? At the other end, doing it, this is a collaborative, creative person with whom you're working. Right, and I think certainly there's great technology. When I originally hired Joe, who's my ops manager, he's like my right hand, I had envisioned he's going to be sitting here right next to me, nine to five (laughs) each day, and we actually were like, this is not going to work for us. We don't want to do this. We don't want to waste time commuting. We'd rather have more time working. So your perspective might change as you go through the process. Mm -hmm. That's great. Awesome. Well, thank you, Emily. I think this, to me, it's expanded my thinking again. So I appreciate Mm -hmm. that. And I kind of love that 
not only is this something that you have come up with as a solution, having tried all sorts of other different approaches, that you've ended up on the strategic solution side, specifically for business owners and team leaders. I think that's kind of profound. But this is how your company is structured as well. You know, if there's anyone who's an expert to talk about it, it's you, because you do both on the front stage and the backstage. This is your life. This is what you do. This is how you run things. So I really appreciate the perspective, the tools, the resources. Everyone, please check out DelegateSolutions.com. Emily is just always thinking and writing about this and has great tools and very specific direction. You're a very organized, systematic person, so I appreciate that because I can see that in your, in your website. And I know I've learned a lot, and that was why I reached out to you at the very beginning is because I'm like, I knew I needed to talk to someone about virtual workers, and you're it. You're the person who's, to my mind, come at it from the highest level of thinking in terms of what true leverage really is, especially for those of us who can't figure out what to delegate. <laughs> so I I just really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your input and your perspective, especially about the future. Wow, 2016, 2020, and how many people are just going to be working at least part of the time, virtually or, or remotely. That's a very profound shift in how we do things. And I'd like to be on the front of the curve, not underneath it. <laughs> <laughs> or at the front of the wave not being crushed. So again, thank you for all your insights. Any last things you'd like to share or advice for people as we close out? Thinking about it in a way that is more positive way of thinking about it rather than the fear part. You know, you're able to access talent that by working with remote people that you wouldn't normally be able to access because of location. So think about the value that that could add to your organization. Think about the caliber of people you might be able to attract if you're not looking for an FTE, you're just really looking for a strategic person to accomplish a certain project or goal within your company, you're able to tap into this resource that maybe you couldn't normally afford to hire or bring out to wherever your location is. So there's lots of value to it, not just fear. (laughs) And I think that's great. And again, I get excited because I think about projects that I might not do because I don't have the resources. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, there's one right in front of me. And that seems like a really exciting possibility. And I know for some people listening, they're like, oh, I could actually do this and I could do that and I could leverage this person. And I think one of the things that a lot of people, and sometimes us included, we don't realize that some people are, as you said, underwhelmed. Some people are overwhelmed or underemployed, overemployed. And to have a structure to balance that out, to really kind of add some stop gaps and some ways to smooth it out, I think makes a ton of sense. So again, I feel as always talking to you that my thinking has expanded, my insight has expanded. One of the things we didn't talk about a ton today is just how many technological resources you and your team know. So by all means, again, check out DelegateSolutions.com because I'm so impressed by that list. And I like that you're always finding the new stuff, checking it out, seeing if it's worthwhile, if it is adding it to your repertoire. And I know from one of my close friends who's in the program that you coached his team on how to use one of the big project management tools. Yes, Asana. (laughs) Mm -hmm, Which was great. I love that. I love that there's an expert out there who can educate me and make this whole thing better. So thank you, Emily. Great, great talking to you again. And again, thanks for sharing your expertise. And I hope, again, for everyone listening, that you're excited about how you can put in place those capabilities to help you reach your goals. And it may be a little bit different than how you've done it in the past or how you were thinking about it, but these opportunities and options are now available. So Emily, thank you. And I know I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Shannon. Great. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode with Emily Morgan of Delegate Solutions on how to really make it work with remote workers and also the future of work and how things will be changing. So if you have any questions or comments, please let us know at questions at strategiccoach.com. And as always, here's to your team success. Hi, Shannon here, and thank you very much for listening. If you like what you heard today, please take a moment to rate the Team Success Podcast on iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd share the podcast with anyone else who could benefit. If you're interested in learning more about the Strategic Coach Program for Entrepreneurs, visit us at strategiccoach.com or the Strategic Coach channel on YouTube. For free downloads and more Team Success strategies, visit teamsuccesshandbook.com.